Good morning. Pascal had two theories. One of them was, um, well, he had more probably, but one of them was, if you, don't, if you believe in God and you're right, this is good and it's a good choice. If you believe in God and he doesn't exist, you haven't lost anything. Whereas if you don't believe in God and you're wrong, that's a big deal, um, and so on. And the other one was, which is more pertinent to the sermon, really, um, he said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I, I've written you such a long letter, I didn't have time to write a short one. And when you read these two readings from today, just a few days before the, um, the service, and then you prepare your sermon at the last minute, that is a danger, because uh, there's a lot in today's two readings. Uh, but it doesn't start either on the road to Damascus or in... Um, or by the Sea of Tiberias. Uh, it starts at my workplace, where uh, there's a guy I was talking to, and two things happened. The first one was, um, um, I, I have a cup at work that was given to me by my great aunt, and it says on it, um, I'm an engineer, why don't we just agree that I'm right and save the time of the argument? Um, and, he was, he, he, and he did point out to me, this friend of mine at work, that that, that law, that cup actually breaks two laws, one of which is I'm not allowed to call myself an engineer in Quebec, uh, and the other one of which is it's only written in English. So he, was, um, he complained about that. And, and it kind of got me thinking back to my olden days at work when I was a young engineer. And there was a, well, he was a character, really, a guy who was a super, super, super good engineer. But he was also a farmer. So he'd actually come in straight from the fields into work at Rolls-Royce, uh, dressed in Wellington boots, believe it or not. And you kind of got the whiff of farmyard as he, as he walked past. But he kind of got away with it because he was about the most brilliant engineer Rolls-Royce had. And he came to me because I was working with him a little bit on some project and uh, eventually I found some sums and he said, I, that agrees with my prejudice, so it must be right. Uh, that, that was his, because uh, he kind of knew what the answer was going to be, I think, but he, he needed somebody to go do the sums to, to figure it out. Uh, and, and so we were talking about that a bit at work. And then, um, and then the guy I was talking to, he started talking about um, the echo chamber, which apparently is a term of today, although I didn't know it before. And what it was saying is, is that um, if you listen, when, when you're reading stuff and talking to people and listening to people, the opinions that you agree with, you tend to give a strong weight to, whereas the opinions you don't agree with, you tend to discount. And the more you, and, and social media plays into that totally, because the more you go online and you read your news, the more it feeds you with news of the same type. And the more you, the more you Google um, or, or Pinterest or anything else, artwork or music chords, the more it gives you that sort of thing. You think, aha, he's interested in that. I'm going to give him more. And, and then it causes a polarization because, because if, you, if you follow the Republicans, you watch Fox News and they tell you all the stuff about how right you are. And if you follow the Democrats, you follow CNN and they tell you how, how right you are. And, um, and, of course, when, when you discuss those things with people of the same mind as you, they agree with you, so it's all good. Um, but, and, and, and if, if Mr. Trump has, has taught us anything, it, it's, that, uh, it's that facts don't really matter very much, actually. That, that just because you, you happen to have the laws of physics and science and the facts on your side, uh, doesn't mean that people will change your mind uh, or that change their mind. And as a more parochial example, I know that if I don't start doing exercise and I keep overeating, I, I will put on weight. Has that changed my mind? No, not yet. Uh, it's just a fact that I happen to know. And, 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 and if you're confrontational, um, often that doesn't change people's mind either. It just causes people to dig their heels in. And eventually you might kind of force them to go down some road. Uh, but you know, it's with it's not with acquiescence. It's because they're they're kind of compelled to do it. So the the action might go, but the heart doesn't go. Um, and then and then and so 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 that does bring us to Paul because he was um, he was very definitely right. He was or Saul actually was very definitely right. He was a Roman. He was a Pharisee. He was the most Pharisee-like of all the Pharisees. He was very zealous. He was, and, and he realized that, that this Christianity, the way, the way, as it was called at the time, was, was going to tear down the whole thing. So clearly he had to suppress it. So he was going around, he was killing Christians. He, he watched Stephen be stoned. Um, he heard Stephen forgive them at, at, at the end. 
and and he was he was all round doing what he believed was for the best because he was he was right, and but I guess um, I, I I guess Jesus did want him on his team actually, because but he didn't try and persuade him by saying ah oh, you know. I think you're interpreting thou shalt not murder a bit wrongly. You know, maybe we ought to talk about the real meaning of that bit of um, Exodus. Because I think he kind of felt that, yeah, he probably was right, but it probably wouldn't work. So eventually, uh, as, as you know, because you all listened to Acts 9 verses 1 to 6 a few minutes ago, as Paul was going to Damascus to, um, to oppress more Christians and send them back to be uh, dealt with, uh, he encountered a blinding light on the road and a, a message that was not very subtle. You know, sometimes in the Gospels and in the Bible, the call is a bit subtle. You know, this was not subtle. Uh, this was, no, you're persecuting me. Go and think about it really hard. And by the way, you're now blind and you're not going to eat or drink anything for a bit. Uh, this, this was not kind of the, hey, you might want to think about this. It was in your face a bit. Um, so some, some might say that, that from that... Um, some might, well, some do write that actually the seeds of that might have been sown by, by Stephen doing the forgiveness, that it, it sowed a seed in Paul's mind that maybe there was something more to this than he was really um, interpreting at the time. Um, but ultimately, that encounter with Jesus really did change his mind. Arguably, it formed the whole church as we, well, maybe not as we know it today, but certainly as it started out then and it has evolved to, to where it is today. And, and, as we've spoken about many times, any encounter with Jesus does force you to, to change your mind. It forces that, that change of thought. But if it's hard enough to change our mind when, when, it's, um, you know, when, when it's just a piece of engineering or a, a you know, fact about climate change or a graph of CO2, it, it's, it's even harder when, when that changing of the mind really does involve changing who your identity is, which it generally does if it involves changing your beliefs. Um, for Paul, his identity was Pharisee, Jew, Roman, etc., etc., etc. And really to change, to follow through with that encounter with Jesus, he had to totally change his, his identity and his beliefs. He had to stop believing that the law was the right thing, and he had to... He actually went away into the desert for two years, after which he, you know, that thought process came to be this whole thing that no grace and love is the answer, not the law and oppression. Um, and we all have those identities and, and beliefs that we, we carry with us and that we, we hold. And it might be our job or it might be our garden or that we're house proud or that we have to have things tidy. Or Some of them are very banal, some of them are very important and, and crucial to us. But ultimately they're, they're what we build our life on, consciously or, sub, or subconsciously. And to change to change that um, to change that is means changing a, a big deal of our life. It means going back to the foundations, um, and and probably probably those foundations don't change if we just keep talking to people of the same opinion and the same facts, or we keep reading the same thing. There has to be there has to be a different point of view or a different opinion, and we have to be open minded to that opinion and listen to it. As ultimately Paul was, you know, he, even though he was. And struck with a sledgehammer he, he didn't have to follow that path um, good friends good family members can challenge in love that is this the right thing are you really is that really the path you want to follow um, and it's okay because you know that there's that that safe space there uh, meeting in G with Jesus as with Paul as with others in church or in prayer or in study also does challenges so ask St Paul or St Peter or any of the other folks in the Gospels um, that, that that encounter is a big deal and forces that change of 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 depth of understanding and um, maybe to close this little bit you know there's 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 a quote that I picked up the other day which was you know, do the best you can uh, with what you know now but then when you know more do better uh, and that that cycle of going round and being able to reevaluate opinions based on knowing a bit more and being open minded to go and find out that more is is a crucial part i think of being a christian and being being a person so on the other side relating to the gospel um there were some there were some disciples who if you remember jesus had said right at the start to them come follow me and i will make you fishers of people i suppose i will make you instead of catching fish you'll you'll catch people and and those folks had you know with jesus gone as they thought they'd gone back to their their original path they were catching fish they were selling fish and they were they were doing what they needed to do 
And and then Jesus Jesus appears and of course and he he starts to talk to them and he he said, go and put your net on the the right side. Um, and it's hard and looking around this very big and you know sometimes lovely building, not not to think a little bit about are we as a church casting our net not on the right side. Um, the the uncomfortable truth that I think we are waking up to on the West Island is is. Probably every single church on the West Island, every single Anglican church on the West Island has got about this number of people in it today. The average attendance is 50. We had 17 this morning, about 20 now, 37. It's not that far off. So none of the Anglican churches on the West Island are teeming with two, three, four, five hundred 500 people. And I know numbers aren't everything, uh, but it's also something to, to think in our mind. And I don't believe... I think when I, when I read the bit about casting casting the net on the other side I, I was thinking it's easy to blame and be mad and be angry and to say why why is it like this why is it and and I don't think Jesus was saying to the disciples you're not working hard enough you're not faithful you're not you're not being disciples you're not being Christians he was just saying you need to throw your net over the other side and 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 then I I, I kind of tried to link the two together and I was thinking that actually the reason the churches are empty in the morning, I don't think is because we're, we lack faith and enthusiasm and um, that big pile of purses there says that there is still a real hunger for, for doing things as a church, that the other churches are doing good stuff as well in some ways. But there's lots of people um, in many houses just out there whose identity is really not bound up with going to church on, on Sunday mornings. And much as we might like to think that our church is a place of compassion, of worship, of healing, of community, of social justice, of, of all these good things, there are an equal number, of, well, actually not equal, if only it was equal, uh, there are many other people whose view of church is that it's an instrument of control, of oppression, of hypocrisy, of irrelevance, of boredom, of arrogance, of money grabbing, all sorts of other things. And what the piece about the echo chamber says is that clearly we will read things that probably reinforce our view because we pick up on it of yes all those good things about church and really really I believe that's what we're trying to make it be um, if you're not in that though your 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 opinion is probably informed by all the things that are out there and there are many that would reinforce your your view of the church as being all those very negative things so so and, and we know we know that we because it's obvious apparently that you can't convince people with facts and I think I've said before that uh, if, if I were to stand up this morning and say hey guys I've got a conclusive proof that Jesus rose from the dead on Easter day um, next week there would probably still be 20 people and 17 people I don't think it would be posted on Facebook and then you know we'd be flocked flocked through um, so how do we how do we follow that through that persuasiveness that says says to people whose view of Jesus and God, which is affected by their view of the church, of course, because we are the body of Christ, how do we say, well, that might have been your experience, and probably if that was your experience, you were probably right to stay home on Sunday mornings. How do we, how do we, how do we change that view and say, but with what you know now about Jesus, with what you've learned about Jesus, then maybe that wasn't, maybe that's not now the, the right thing. Um, and 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 I, I, as I, I I can put it in the email, but I'll recap it a little bit. But I know Mert spoke last week on how do you how do you tell the stories of the Bible today in a way that means something to somebody, uh, and we we chatted about it a bit. Although I haven't listened to the sermon, but I will. Uh, honest, uh, we talked about it a bit, and and I was struck when I you know, I hunt around the BBC website from time to time just to to look at what's there. And there was a story about about a disabled lady who, and she was she was recounting. Her, she was not a Christian, but she was renowned, re recounting her experience of how Christians actually quite often come up and just don't actually not offer. Offer would be um, probably quite nice, but actually say, "I'm going to pray for you to heal you of your of your disability." And she was saying, explaining how that meant her, made her feel and. It kind of got on to talk quite a lot about the theology of disability, and maybe I'll leave a better sermon on that to Lorne, but you can go and read the BBC piece. But what she was saying is that if you're disabled, Jesus going around and healing lots of disabled people on a, in, in the Bible, which is what he does to demonstrate power, 
feels like I'm rejected because I, I'm not healed and probably I can't be healed. So, well, what, what's, this, what's this person got to do with me? But then when you, when you dig a bit deeper and say, well, why, why was Jesus healing disabled people? Well, mostly he was removing a barrier to them worshipping because they were the outcasts. They weren't allowed in the temples. They weren't allowed to come and worship. And, and oh, that makes you think about it a bit differently. And then she was saying, well, when we go to heaven, will I be in a wheelchair still? Well, maybe, maybe not, because maybe being in a wheelchair isn't actually the thing that's keeping me from, from God. Maybe the healing, the healing from God, because we're all sinners, we're all broken, we all need healing. Maybe the healing I need isn't, isn't that. Maybe there are other things that... So, so it was a very thoughtful article, I felt. And how that links into what I just said is because it's a totally different perception of, of what Jesus would say and what Jesus did than probably the mainstream Christian view would be. But it's just so it's somebody looking from the outside in, essentially, and saying, this is, this is how it feels to me, and it's very, very different, probably to what was intended, even, and what was, what was meant. So all of which is to say that, that I think... Um, I, I think the throwing out... The, the, the throwing the net on the other side is intimately linked with how do we tell the stories in a in a more in a, in a way that means something to people today because that the need for those stories is still there the need for healing is still there the need for salvation is still there none of that has gone away for us or for anyone um and and what what seems to come up a couple of times this week also says is that but as we move there, we bring the scars with us. And, and that was another piece in this thing about the disabled uh, lady was that the other thing that really struck her was that Jesus, after his resurrection, still had the scars. So it wasn't that his body was made pure and, and, and whole. And it suddenly struck this. This was a, actually a Church of England priest. And she said, it, it, she said, I don't know why it's taken me this long to realize that, that when Jesus was resurrected and, and made whole again, he could still have the scars. It wasn't that his body was made perfect. Um, he, he brought that with him as part of his story. And, and I, I think maybe we're just not telling those stories in, a, in an effective way and casting the net to the other side would, would involve that. So, and in the end, today's, today's, two, today's two stories were essentially about a friend, Peter, who, who was you know, a really good friend of Jesus, but betrayed him and then today was restored. Of course, that's the other bit that could easily take 10 sermons in its own right, that, that Peter, Peter's restoration, the, the three times being asked if he loved Jesus in exchange for the three times of denying Jesus. And he had an enemy in Paul, a real enemy, who was out to, really out to destroy him, out, out to destroy the church who was changed and transformed and became totally the other way around. He thought he was right. His whole identity was, was, was shifted and, and turned around. And I think in, in all of us, the son of Peter, the betrayer, the son of Peter, the loyal friend, the son of Paul, the enemy, and the son of Paul, the, the passionate believer and, and builder of churches. And it's up to all of us, I think, to keep working out how to how to do that and how to be that Christian that is more the good part of Paul and the good part of Peter. And maybe Jesus gives his well Jesus does give his final guidance to Peter as he's restoring him, it's feed my sheep, tend my flock, and follow me. Uh, that that's really what he comes back to. And maybe that's the test we have to follow as a church in terms of are we telling the stories right and are we doing the right thing and are we helping people come to worship is are we tending sheep and are we following god that is really the the nub of it um so i leave you with some thoughts on saul and paul and peter and maybe avoiding the echo chamber of too many views that just reinforce what we know we need to be open-minded but we also need to cling not cling but hold fast to the faith that jesus is actually the answer and understanding that and keeping re-understanding it and being prepared to re-evaluate who we are and what we do as a result of it is a key part of that.